Hello everyone. I'm your host Sharik Javed from German city of Munich and today we have a very special guest assistant professor of nephrology Dr. Ahmed Arslan from USA Houston. Hello Dr. Dr. Arslan. Hey Sharik, how are you? Assalamualaikum. I'm prime. I'm fine. Walaikum assalam and thank you for uh, giving us the time. I know these are the very precious time for the doctors. Um, first of all tell me the motivation to join my show. <laughs> you know the motivation. You know, I, I can't say no to Sharik. For people who don't know, um, I, I'm sure a lot of people know that we're both from Pakistan. Uh, but for people who don't know, Sharik's mother was my elder sister's first teacher in school. And that was, I think, 35. I'm not going to say the exact number of years so <laughs> to, <laughs> to hide the age. But, you know, we know each other, you know, we know each other since, you know, we were little kids. And, uh, you know, we haven't met for a long time. I think it's been at least five, six years, maybe a little more than that. Yeah. But um, I, I remember having dinner at your place a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if Sharik asks something, of course, I can't say no. So <laughs> the motivation was the text on Facebook Messenger that we want to do a live show. And, you know, I didn't need anything else. You know, So that was basically the motivation. But of course, you know, in these times, I think a lot of people want to hear from doctors, especially friends who don't, you know, people who don't have doctors as friends, um, who don't have any direct communication with the physicians. They might want to know, you know, with whatever is on the news, you know, a lot of people are not sure what's true, what's not true, what's just uh, exaggerated, you know, a panic and what's really, you know, uh, the danger, how long it's going to last. A lot of uncertainties around the healthcare system, a lot of certain uncertainties around um, the economics, the job market, um, how long it's going to last. So a lot of things that people are not sure of. And to be honest, even physicians are not 100% sure. But I just want to share whatever I know um, in case it helps someone feel a little better, you know. Yeah, th thank you very much. It's mm -hmm. a pleasure to have you on our show. And so because pleasure. this series, actually, we are trying to uh, give a positive message to the people, you know, so not not to panic. But we all know that uh, so you know, not, doctors, not, not all positives are good, right? You heard the joke, you know, something positive is going to happen, and someone came back Corona positive. So that, <laughs> <laughs> not all positives are good. So yeah, positive message is good. I, I agree. Yeah. So one of the things uh, for IT people like us is that due to the lockdown, we are now sitting at home, working from home or doing something else. You know, we are trying to uh, get away from all the people. But as doctors, you cannot get away from the people and you are at the place where all the <clears throat> disease is there. And so how is the morale of the doctors around you? You know, I'm in Houston right now and Houston is luckily doing better than rest of the cities in U.S. Some of the cities like New York, I'm sorry, some of the states like New York, New Jersey, um, Washington, um, they were in a much worse shape compared to Texas. Uh, okay. In Houston, things are still under control. Uh, morale is high. Of course, everyone wants to uh, contribute as much as they can towards, you know, um, avoiding coronavirus. So uh, doctors are trying to encourage people to stay home, stay away from anyone who might be sick, don't go out if you know anything is not necessary. Um, initially, there was some questions about how to protect yourself. A lot of hospitals were not providing the protective equipment because of the changing guidelines from the government. You know, our CDC is the, is the major organization, Center for Disease Control, that gives out the guidelines. And they kept changing their guidelines for the first few weeks. You know, initially they said, um, you know, you should not be wearing masks. And then they said, anything is okay. And now they're saying everyone should be wearing a mask. And so that confusion kind of dampened the morale of the doctors. But now that everyone is pretty much on the same page, all the hospitals are trying to get the protective equipment to the doctors. Um, they feel much better about taking care of the patients. So mm -hmm. nothing is, you know, nothing is perfect. But I think um, as long as you're able to contribute to the patient's health um, and you do your best, that's all we ask for. You know, we don't uh, we don't count um, the number of sick or number of people who recovered or number of people who uh, sadly passed away. We just mm -hmm. take it on a day-to-day -day basis. So try to do our best, you know, um, every day. 
basically. Yes, great, great respect for all the doctors, uh, for you, for all the colleagues who are working uh, day and night to save the lives of of everyone. So, uh, regardless of uh, Corona, uh, let's talk about your daily routine uh, at Houston. So, what are all the things you are doing? So, you are doing the lectures, or what is the daily routine? So, I'm basically, you know, as as I said in as you said in the introduction uh, that you posted on Facebook. I'm currently working as part of faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. So I'm affiliated with the Department of Medicine and the Division of the Department of Transplant. So my job at this point entails 80% transplant nephrology and 20% uh, general nephrology. So usually I have three or four clinics a week, about three or four hours a day. And then I round on inpatients. Uh, seeing inpatient transplant, kidney transplant patients for about, you know, two weeks, alternating with my uh, senior partner, Dr. Murthy. And these days, the change in our routine basically is that instead of having face-to-face -face visits with the patients in the clinic, we're trying to do as many televisits as possible, the video, you know, calls. And that has really, um, and that has really affected patients' lives in a better way. You know, when you have to go see a doctor, you probably mm. had experience. You have to drive, I don't know how far you live from your from your hospital or from the clinic. You have to drive about 20, 25 minutes. Then you are waiting in the waiting room. Then you are uh, waiting to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, the nurses come in. So now I just call the patient whenever they're ready. So they don't have to drive. They don't have to pay for the parking. They don't have to wait for me. You know, they are sitting at their home on their couch. We call them, we FaceTime, or you know, we are using Zoom for our televisits. So that is something that has changed. We are trying to do as many televisits as possible. And it, it, it's, it's a good thing as well, because now I'm able to see the patient's house, their family members, they're showing me their dogs, their kids, their, their gardening outside. We get to know our patients a little bit better, I feel like, okay. even if it's not a face-to-face -face visit, I still feel the patients I've talked to, I have a better connection with them, because I get to know really what their lives are like, you know, in the hospital, mm -hmm. when you see them in the patient's gown or you see them in the clinic, you're treating them as a patient. When you see them in their home, um, sitting with their family members, they, they're they more like humans, you know, they're more like your friends that you are having a chat with. And, yeah. and, 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 and during that chat, you can give them medical advice. You can talk to them about their issues. A lot of people, of course, are anxious about what's going on around. So you can give them some reassurance, you know, that everything should be okay. So that's the only thing that has changed mainly. Instead of face-to-face -face visits in the clinic, uh, we are doing more video visits. In the hospital, everything is pretty much the same. You know, we're still going to see the patients, um, you know, who are admitted to mm -hmm. the hospital. So, so actually, this is something really positive and new that you can do daily visits. So maybe this idea can also continue afterwards also, like for the, for the kind of uh, visits when it's not necessary, it's not that's, a surgery or something. That's right? true. That's true, because you don't need to physically examine the patient every time. A lot mm -hmm. of the time when you are talking to the patient is basically just discussing how they're doing, what medications they're taking, you know, um, what their blood pressure is, how they're feeling. A lot of these things can be done at home by the patients themselves. And when you can see them, you can kind of understand how sick they are, if they really need to be physically seen, or you can just advise them on the phone. So I think this is going to stick. I don't think this is going away. Also, now the patients who know that this is possible, you know, that they can see the doctor sitting at home, they would be very, very reluctant to drive all the way to see you because in the Texas Medical Center, it's the, it's the tertiary care cent medical center. You know, our hospital is a tertiary care hospital. So transplants are not done in every hospital, as you know. You know, only some specific centers can do the transplants. So mm -hmm. a lot of our patients are coming from like two hours away, three hours away, four hours away. Sometimes they come to Houston, stay overnight to see us the next day. Um, they spend a lot of money, you know, paying for hotels. So it's going to save them time and money. Um, mm -hmm. So you're right. You know, I think the medical community as well as the patient advocates are going to try and push for more televisits. Mm -hmm. um, this emergency situation, you know, the Medicare, which is the largest insurance payer in the U.S., uh, did not use, I mean, there were video televisits going on, but they were not paying as much as face-to-face -face visits most of the time. And in the in this pandemic situation, they have said that they would pay the doctors and the hospitals, um, even if they do video visits, to avoid catching the infection. So I think 
the policy changes usually are, are never temporary. You know, once they mm. come in, uh, once they take effect, they usually last for a long time. So you are right. I agree with you. This is probably going to stick for a long time. And this, I think this is for the better. Yes, yes. So new technologies are always helping the doctors. Yeah. That's really great. Yes, uh, so yes. in this interview, guys, we will be also asking some layman questions like people like me who are not very much aware of about these me medical technologies, you know, uh, such highly qualified doctors like you. And also <laughs> our viewers are encouraged to ask questions to Dr. Arsalan, who is assistant professor in nephrology in US, and he graduated from Pakistan. This also we will come in, this, we will also ask. So uh, our regular viewer, Umar Nurwala is asking that, so it's also a layman question. So he's asking, what, uh, what will the doctor Saab say about Corona in US, a big and rich country, why they have so many deaths in USA? So the problem is that Corona doesn't take any bribes. So being rich doesn't help. You know, you cannot pay Corona a trillion dollars to make it go away. So the only thing that's going to help get rid of it is essentially at this point, social distancing. Um, the rich country, what US is doing, and which is very fascinating, is that within weeks of discovering about coronavirus, they have already sequenced the genome of the virus. They're already working on the vaccines. A couple of vaccines are already in clinical trials. The trials are ongoing for the new drugs that may help get rid of coronavirus. So unfortunately, the social distancing does not take effect until February. If it was done sooner, mm -hmm. uh, it would have avoided a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion. Um, but money is not the only thing that can prevent this infection. You know, like, you know, rich and poor are kind of getting affected alike. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of uh, yeah. England, he is in ICU right now, you know, um, and I, I'm sure he's getting special treatment, but you know, still it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. So when we, we will also, our viewer want to know, want to know that uh, when did you first came to US and how was the experience? Yeah, so, the medical system a little bit. Yeah, I have a lot of stories about that. I'm not sure how much time do you have, but stop me when, when you have any questions. We, we have a lot of time. See. I think viewers, uh, viewers <laughs> also have a lot of time. We are sitting at home. <laughs> you have to go. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, you know, I graduated from King Edward Medical College. Um, for people who are not from Pakistan or who don't know about it, it's one of the oldest medical schools in the country, basically established by the British in 1860s, I believe. And it's affiliated with uh, the largest hospital of the country, Mayo Hospital, which has more than 2,000 beds. So that's a lot of beds. Um, so I was, uh, I was there for, you know, five years. And after graduating, I did my internship, which is called House Job in Lahore, you know, King Edward Medical College Affiliated Hospital, and then in Royal Pindi. And after doing my USMLEs, I came to US in 2008 when I was interviewing for my residency. So I was traveling a lot, visiting different hospitals, interviewing. And then I joined my residency in 2009. So I permanently kind of permanently moved to US. Uh, in 2009. To answer your question about, you know, the difference that I felt when I moved here, um, you know, patients in Pakistan are very different from patients in US. And mm -hmm. here, a lot of things are very straightforward. You know, like you ask someone, you know, taking history, talking to the patient, and there are a lot of good things about the medical system in Pakistan too. I'm just trying to tell you some lighter stories, you know. Um, when you ask someone in Pakistan, like someone comes to you and tells you, oh, I have, a, I have a stomach ache or I have diarrhea, you know, and you would ask a simple question, oh, when did it start? You know, here patients will tell you it started three days ago, it started five days ago. Uh, in Pakistan, it's really funny. It's different. They will tell you, oh, uh, two weeks ago, I was traveling on the train from Lahore to Karachi. And I got out of the train on the Miyachanu station and I ate some chane or I ate some dal and nothing happened on that trip. And I came back to Lahore and I was fine for another week. 
why did you tell me about that trip? I don't know. But, you know, they will give you the whole history, try to relate every medical problem to what they ate, what they drank, you know, what they what they had at home. You know, if their cousin visited, you know, he didn't look well. And I think that's the reason I got. So they will <laughs> tell you a long story. So I had I had a recall of that. Like I, I had um, one of my patients in a transplant clinic was a Pakistani patient and husband and wife and the wife needed a a transplant and I remember it was kind of a flashback all over again I asked uh, I asked the patient when was she diagnosed with diabetes and her husband started the story all the way from like three years ago when they went to the doctor and you know the doctor was on the third floor and they were on the first floor and they told me everything which was completely not related to the medical issues. They said, oh, we went to that doctor. He was from that part of India, but he was on the third floor and there was no elevator and I couldn't walk because of the knee pain. So we decided not to go to him. Hmm. Why, why are you telling me about the doctor that you didn't even go to? So they tell you everything. They try to, you know, keep posted about their that's, whole... That's just, yeah, that is very interesting. And also about the, like, the medical system. Uh, yeah. the defense, if you want to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, Medical system, of course, is different in Pakistan. You know, the, the major difference and the major change that we would love to see in the medical system in Pakistan is, is the respect and autonomy for the patients. A lot of patients who used to come to our hospitals um, and got admitted, they used to sign a blanket consent saying, I consent to everything that is going to be done to me in the hospital for the rest of my stay. And whatever happens, you know, no one is responsible. Mm -hmm. So there's no accountability. There's no autonomy. There is no concept that if you're going to do a procedure, if you're going to, uh, you have to give all the details to the patients. You have to discuss the risks, the benefits, the alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's a blanket consent and the doctors uh, are not liable for any mistakes that they make. Uh, patients are not asked before anything is done to them. Um, here, you know, it, you have to be, you have to be very, very cautious. You cannot even uh, put an IV line in a patient without getting their their permission. Mm -hmm. And that also, you know, in, in your medical school, when you are learning, a lot of funny things happen. It reminds me of a, of a small incident. We were in fourth year of medical school. Talking about patient's autonomy, I remember just a funny story, basically. Um, and, and the patients used to be, of course, the specimen, right? The, you are learning on the patient. There's, a, there's not a lot of simulation labs or not a lot of mannequins or uh, artificial, you know, ro robots or something to teach you the procedures. Um, not a lot of dummies. So basically you are learning on the patients. Yep. And we were in this urology class. I'm sure all your audience are adults, right? None of them is like below 18 years old, hopefully. But <laughs> they were teaching us prostate exam. You know, it's a prostate exam. You have to do a rectal exam, feel the prostate, and, and assess the size of the prostate. And there was an old, we, we call these people Babaji in Pakistan, old Babaji, about 70 years old, who was in the ward. And, you know, the whole badge is there. Now, like, eight, nine girls and eight, nine boys, you know, some like 15, 20 medical students are yes. there mm -hmm. and the professor of urology is teaching them how to do a prostate exam on that babaji who's lying there you know it's like mm -hmm. so everyone is okay babaji they're learning okay come on beta come on everyone is doing <laughs> the exam one person second person third person fourth babaji would get up after three or four you know exams oh i'm, I'm going i'm going this is enough <laughs> no no babaji they're learning let them learn babaji they're learning so oh one more exam one more exam finally babaji stood up so, babaji they're learning Babaji said, no, this is not a school, okay? I'm leaving. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Babaji had no say in, in, in who would be examined. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you can do this here, you know. So yeah. I think that's, that's a major difference. Uh, th thanks, thanks for these interesting <laughs> stories. For the viewers who joined later, so we have Dr. Yeah. Arsalan, who is Assistant Professor of Nephrology at Houston, USA. And today we are not talking much about coronavirus. We are talking light stories uh, about his experience in US, his, about his medical education in Pakistan, and also specialization in US for a lighter note. Uh, and when I was a small child, you know, small naughty child, I used to play cricket or do funny stuff all day and not listen to my parents. Then my parents used to give example of this. Uh, uh, guy in high school who was topping all the exams and that was <laughs> <laughs>
So now he's assistant professor, and uh, I'm not. <laughs> Masha, you're doing great. You are doing better things than I'm doing. You know, I'm just doing no, my no, job. No, of course not. <laughs> I know you wear you wear a lot of hats with your cricket board, and you're very involved in your social, you know, uh, circle and in the Pakistani Indian community. You've done a lot of good things, to be honest. I'm I'm a huge fan. You know, we follow your your blog okay. pretty regularly. You know, we're all proud of you. I'm okay. sure your parents are proud of you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then he went to the best medical school, also got the best grades, and then he came to US. So now I'm curious that once you came here after getting all the best grades over there, yeah. how was your first experience in US starting to pass these kind of exams? I don't yeah, know, yeah. USMLE or STEPS, what is it's called? So I'll tell you, you know, I know a lot of people are, you know, unless there are some medical students or some people who are taking USMLEs, um, they, they're probably not interested in, in educational advice. But I'll tell you something. When I came to US, you know, the first city I, I worked in was um, Englewood in New Jersey. And Englewood is a city in New Jersey right next to New York. So as mm -hmm. soon as you cross uh, George Washington Bridge from New York into New Jersey, uh, the first city is is Englewood. And we had a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a very good community. We had a lot of Spanish patients. So I'm not sure how much you know about Spanish. I had no idea about Spanish. And um, a lot of these patients, uh, uh, you know, we would use a translator to, to talk to them. But what happened was that when, when, when we used to be in clinic, we had to go out and call the patient's name to get them into the, into the clinic, okay? And the Spanish letters are pronounced differently than English letters, even, mm -hmm. even though the letters are the same. Like J is pronounced at H. And U is pronounced as U. So if, if you know, if, if someone is names is spelled as Jesus, you would call them Jesus. And in and German, it will be like a Y. J will be like a Y. You, you pronounce like a Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I had no idea. I've never met a Spanish before. I've never like learned about Spanish before. No one warned me about anything. So luckily or unluckily, my first patient's name was Jesus. And I had to go out and call the patient's name. You know, all the patients were sitting in the waiting room. And, you know, I, the nurse said, okay, your next patient is this. She gave me the chart. I went out to the room and I started calling, Jesus, Jesus. And everyone was looking at me. This guy has converted. He's from Pakistan. He just moved to U.S. Like, what happened? Has, is he asking for, like, is he, has he gone crazy? Why is he yelling Jesus in the middle of the, in the, middle of the waiting room? So, so one of the nurses pulled me back and they said, you know, this is not Jesus. This is Jesus. This is how you pronounce it. I, it took me a while to understand, you know, understand. <laughs> Finally, I, I, I learned to ask questions in Spanish. I can ask all the questions in Spanish now, but I can't understand the answers. You know, because <laughs> I, learned, I learned all the questions. But if the patient assumes that you know how to speak Spanish, they start giving you answers in Spanish. And the answer is never one word. It's always like big stories just like Pakistani stories. So they would start from like two years ago when they were fine and they met their cousin and got married and had kids, you know, all the way back. So <laughs> once they speak Spanish, they will tell you the whole story and they speak really fast. So um, it's really hard to understand what they're saying. So sometimes I would ask the questions and say, can you please answer yes or no, like see or no? And then you can say you have pain here, pain here, pain here, dolor aquí, dolor aquí, and you know, then you can name all the organs. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an interpreter, you can you can you can get by um, using like small phrases and telling the patients, "I don't speak Spanish. Don't assume I speak Spanish. <laughs> Just give me yes or no answers." You know, so that's one mm -hmm. story I learned. Uh, you know, I, I experienced right after you know right after I moved to US. The other thing, you know, that when I moved to Mississippi, I was I was practicing internal medicine before I. Um, before I did nephrology. So I was doing internal mm -hmm. medicine for about five years, working as a hospitalist um, in, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Forest General Hospital, one of the best hospitals in the state, actually in the country, with very advanced hospital. You would, you would think, you know, a hospital in Mississippi might not be as advanced as hospitals in Houston, but mm -hmm. the, the administration there, the staff there, I'm not sure if someone would be listening to this later, they do a tremendous job staying ahead of the curve. Like they got the electronic medical record when the whole country was thinking about it. You know, uh, I, I saw an email from them three or four weeks ago 
even though they didn't have any cases of corona, they were hiring extra nurses, extra respiratory therapists to staff in case of an emergency. They were not waiting for a disaster to happen. They were prepared ahead of time. So I was in Forest General Hospital for five years. And in Mississippi, people are very independent. Like they like to go out, they're outdoorsy. They're, you may have seen, you know, the, the South, the typical American South. You know, they like to hunt, they like to fish, they like to camp, they like to own guns. You know, so they're very outdoorsy and very, uh, practical. For me, you know, I was raised in a very um, kind of supportive environment, mm -hmm. where I did not have to do a whole lot myself when I was home. So I never learned how to fix the plumbing or how to fix the car or, you know, these little handy things that people can do and usually are, are comfortable doing themselves. So, you know, I had a lot of problems getting help you know, whenever some, so I always prefer staying in an apartment. If something breaks, they come and fix it. If you're in a house, then you have to fix things yourself. And the mm -hmm. first day I remember I was heading to the hospital at, and I'm not, so I'm not an outdoorsy person. I don't know uh, if someone tells me go West, I don't know where West is. Like I'm, I'm sitting here. I have to see where the sun rises. I have to see where the sun is going to set. Then I have to face this. So I, I really have no direction of where the North is and where the West is. And they kept telling me go, you know, I was asking them for direction on the phone. And, and uh, I remember Ed Askew was the, the physician who was giving me directions. And he used to camp and hunt and all that. And he said, hey, man, go west from there. I said, where is west? He said, are you crazy? You don't know where west is? <laughs> yeah. I said, tell me right or left. He said, how do I know where you are facing? You know? <laughs> I said, okay, yeah. I'm facing. In front of me, there is a sign that says stop. Tell me where to go. <laughs> and it was a big mm -hmm. mess. So, so finally, I but at learn. least now people just use Google Maps, you know. It's much yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, no. but but you know, in some parts of the in some parts of the country, it won't take you to the right um, to the right place. Don't trust Google Maps too much. You know, I read this thing, and um, you know, uh, you all know Harari. He's a he's a writer who wrote three best selling books recently. Uh, yeah. Sapiens, Homo Deus, and the and the last one was the 20, 21 lesson in twenty first century. Great books, you know. You may differ from his uh, opinions. He's an atheist, and you know, but he, great books on history, the future mm -hmm. of mankind, things that are happening right now. And he was basically saying the artificial intelligence is now controlling you. You know, like humans were controlling animals. Same way, artificial intelligence is now controlling humans in a way that we don't question the artificial intelligence. And he quoted this incident where a Japanese guy was driving a car and following Google Maps. And he actually entered into a lake, like he drove into a lake because Google Maps said, go straight ahead. He was looking at this water, like pond of water ahead of him. And he was like, okay, but Google Maps says, go ahead. Maybe I'm just, you know, hallucinating, or maybe it's just a little bit of water and I will be able to cross it. And he entered, you know, head first <laughs> into the water following Google Maps. So it's in Homo Deus, like it's a, it's a great book. But yeah, you're right, Google. I, I'm, I'm very dependent on Google Maps, even when I'm going to work. I'm using Google Maps because it would take you to the shortest and fastest route. So but at least I hope that on your way there is not a lake. No there is lake. no lake. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to follow the lake signs. <laughs> so we will now talk about another aspect. So you said um are you also teaching at the hospital? You have students? Uh, yes. So how's the experience of teaching so far? So right? basically most of our teaching is uh, teaching on the rounds. So when, when we are rounding on, you know, on the patients as, as faculty, you always have a fellow with you. A fellow is someone who has done internal medicine training and now they're doing nephrology specialty training. And then we have medical residents, we have medical students. So you are essentially supervising them. They're all, you know, fine mm -hmm. graduates. They know about medicine. All they need is some some direction into you know what they need to do some fine tuning you know answer some questions if they have them make sure they don't do any major mistakes so when we are rounding you know we kind mm -hmm. of uh, on every patient we try to find a couple of things that they need to learn that they may not be comfortable doing um, and nephrology you know kidney diseases although people think you are a kidney specialist but kidneys affect all the organs of the body because they have to clear out the toxins, they have to get rid of uh, everything that can affect, you know, the rest of your body. If kidneys are not doing your job, not doing their job, not getting rid of these toxins, it can affect your brain, it can affect your heart. I'm just trying to, you know, 
publicize my speciality a little bit because <laughs> a lot of people, you know, these days don't think that nephrology is very important. Everyone wants to be a, a neurosurgeon or, you know, a cardiac surgeon. But nephrology deals with a lot of subjects. You know, we deal with uh, the, the blood. We deal with, you know, we deal with lungs. We deal with heart. We deal with hormones. Uh, uh, we deal with the blood pressure. So there are a lot of things to teach, you know. So you kind of try to find out what's the area where the student is not comfortable with, the resident or the fellow is not comfortable with. And then you try to teach them for a couple of minutes about that subject. We don't... Uh, do whiteboard lectures, you know, we don't have time for that during the rounds because you have to take mm -hmm. care of 20, 25 patients, you have to make decisions on them, you have to talk to the ICU teams, the medical teams about what the plan would be, who would need dialysis, who would not need dialysis, mm -hmm. who would need to be in ICU. So, so during that decision making, basically you're thinking out loud and thinking your own thoughts with the students and residents and fellows who are following you and they kind of learn on the job, you know. Uh, once in a while, like once every month, uh, every couple of months, we give lectures to the fellows. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just next week, I'm doing um, this 30-minute lecture followed by 10-minute stand-up comedy for for oh. the fellows. <laughs> because as you said, everyone is depressed, so they want to hear some jokes. So I said, okay. So it's, it's your own plan or it's in the plan from the university? So basically, they know I like uh, to watch uh, sitcoms and stand-ups. Uh, like all my friends know about it. I'm, I'm a big fan of anything funny that's playing on TV. I watched all the shows all the way back to like 50s and 60s on Netflix and Hulu and, you know, uh, going back from Friends and Cheers and Frasier all the way to Dick Van Dyke show and MASH. Mm -hmm. So they don't have an interest. I watch stand-up comedians like Jim Gaffigan, Trevor Noah. And so I, I have an interest and I like jokes. So they said, okay, you like jokes. You have an interest. You know, so make us laugh. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's not easy to make people laugh on Zoom. It's mm -hmm. a Zoom, you know. So yeah. it's not a stand-up. It's more like a sit-down comedy. But we'll see. That, that's really <laughs> interesting. So you know, a very intelligent and well-reputed doctor, and then some fun jokes fun, in the in the mood also. But we do also some physical sports or something. So I like. You know, I used to be very active. Um, until a few years ago, um, used to play regularly until, you know, I graduated from medical school. I was part Which of sport? Lot. I used to play a lot of different sports. So, so I'm not sure if you remember, I was in Cadet College, Hassan Abdal, so it's a boarding yes. school. And when I was there, you know, you get to play everything. You get to play cricket, soccer, basketball, table tennis, long tennis, you know, you play squash, you learn swimming. So over the five years, because it's a boarding school, they try to teach you everything. So while I was there, I was doing almost everything. By the end of it, I kind of developed an interest in playing basketball. So I was uh, the captain of my college team, uh, vice captain of my college team. And then in medical school, I was the captain of my team. So I still have a small uh, basketball court in my yard. And I'm trying to teach my son and daughter. You know, they're five and seven. So these mm -hmm. days, I'm trying to teach them how to play basketball. Now that they yeah. can't go okay. out, you know, they're indoors yeah. most of the time. They're learning a little bit of uh, dribbling. I'm not playing with adults, so mm -hmm. it's not very tiring. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to save some energy. But yeah, yeah, sports, exercise, you know, a lot of people ask this question about how to boost your immunity and the things that are out there, a lot of myths about, you know, stuff that may or may not work. You may, you know, probably you're also getting all these WhatsApp messages about onions and kulwanji and all the fruits and vegetables that you put close to your... Uh, put close to your leg or put close to your nose and it will catch all the virus mm -hmm. and it will kill the virus. But the best thing to boost your immunity is a healthy lifestyle, like always. You know, you need to make sure that you eat healthy, you don't miss your meals, you're not eating a lot of fatty and, you know, high carbohydrate foods. Um, mm -hmm. I'll answer this question about CCH, you know. Uh, yeah, because I did not understand that so there is a question. But CCH, you is, uh, CCH, CCH is a short for uh, Cadet College Hassan Abdal. Oh, okay. So basically, yeah, I was there. I graduated in 2000, and I had a great experience. I may have missed on some of the family occasions. You know, I may not be, you know, my, my mom still blames me for going to CCH. Because right before I went to CCH, she was, we, we lived in Karachi. And the cadet college is in Atak. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's close to Islamabad. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to go back and forth between Karachi and and, and uh, cadet college. So my mom... Um, 
bribed me. You know, she said, okay, I'm going to buy you a bike and I'm going to buy you this and that. And I said, yeah, let's do that. You know, let's buy all that stuff. I'm not going to CCH. And so I think we bought almost everything. And then I said, you know, I saw their prospect prospectus, you know, for the cadet college. And they had all these nice pictures of the squash courts and basketball courts and all these like nice things. Okay. That it's very attractive. It sounded very, yeah, very tempting. So I decided to go there. And I, I don't regret it. I think it helped me a lot. Um, make friends, make connections. Um, you 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 kind of develop the confidence in yourself that you're an independent person. You cannot just keep relying on your parents for everything. And, mm-hmm. and academically too, I think it it boosted uh, it boosted me a lot because there's a lot of competition when you are in a competitive environment. You the best you know the best comes out. Um, the first time I moved there, you know, I, I stood tenth in my class. And I was mm-hmm. shocked, and you know, I always used to be first in my class, and I used to see it, you know, and I was tenth. And I said, "Oh, like you need to work harder." And then after that, every time you know there was an exam, I I, I scored very well. So um, it, I think it helped me. If I if I stayed at home, I may not have done as good as I did when I was there. So I also have things that changed from CCH actually. <laughs> because I never been to Cadet College as an abnormal, but I know that people who went there because it's it. I think it was associated to federal board or. Because it was associated with Alpindi board. Now it's been so all the people who used to go there. They used to top the board. One of the things that yes, I know. Yeah. And second yes. thing I know that uh, once I don't know if it, once after I graduated, I said okay, maybe I should try for military. And I went uh, just for fun with we applied for ISSB and then we went to this uh, cohort. And ah. then th- there there was a whole batch of people uh, students or uh, from. Cadet College Hassan Abdal, and then we knew that we had no chance, and then, of course we had no chance. And then and they were very already well prepared, but I yeah. think, but it was a fun trip for me. But we met very yeah. disciplined guy, and disciplined kind of for me a semi-army. very difficult. Thing. Yeah, it was a semi-army environment. Like a lot of people used to go into like medical schools and engineering colleges, but just because of the routine, like when you wake up in the morning, you are doing PT for an hour, then you are doing drill, you are learning all these things. The discipline, the rules. Mm-hmm. So I think it's probably a little easier for them to get into army compared to you know, yeah. people outside. So um, that was a very good experience about CCH. So now we are ending towards the last, uh, you can say, five or ten minutes, and it was a wonderful discussion. But we will encourage our viewers to ask all kind of questions regarding a medical system in US or some things they want to relate from uh, Pakistan. Uh, in the beginning. Uh, we were talking about uh, that these days there are a lot of uh, telemedicine going on you know you were um, telling that you are look uh, uh, taking a lot of tele calls and taking care of the m- m- patient uh, our viewer thinks so we are so uh, mama is saying what are your views for developing telemedicine telemedicine portals in pakistan a lot of alumni groups are working on various projects for developing healthcare system in pakistan so what are your views to promote it as i said earlier i think it's a great opportunity especially now that internet is everywhere and almost everyone has a smartphone if they don't have a laptop so it's very easy for patients to talk to their doctors and very easy for doctors to schedule appointments in a way where they can give full attention to the patient talk to them address their concerns and i know um because i follow some of the pages from my king edward you know from my medical school and they have already started uh, telemedicine uh, especially during this corona situation so i i know one of our psychiatrists um dr ali hashmi he's doing psychiatry sessions using telemedicine just using these telemedicine portals to talk to the patient and a lot of other specialties where either you don't need to touch the patient or just seeing them with your eyes mm-hmm. is is enough to make a diagnosis most of the diagnosis of course these days is dependent on history taking you're talking to the patient asking questions and then we are very dependent on labs you know the blood work and radiology x-rays cat scans physical exam has become a really small part of our our practice more so because you know used to be like 20 years ago when i was in medical school Uh, our professors would teach us how to palpate the liver how to determine size of the liver based on t- murmurs um, and then see which valve of the heart is involved 
it's kind of been proven over the last few years that all these techniques are not 100% perfect. So you can make a guess, make an educated guess, but you can never be sure if your mitral valve is leaking or tricuspid valve is leaking mm -hmm. based on the physical exam. So in the end, you have to do an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, you know, ultrasound of the liver. You have to do an X-ray of the chest. So, so the physical exam, especially in US, uh, has become a very small part of our uh, patient interaction. So telemedicine in this situation, when physical exam is really not contributing very much, I think it's a great idea for the patients, great idea for the physicians. It's going to save them a lot of time and money. I know in UK, they're still very dependent on physical exam. They want to save as much money for NHS as possible. So they try to make diagnosis based on history and physical exam, which may be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know, you know, but uh, especially in US, I think it's, it's a great idea. Even in Pakistan, for specialities that don't need a physical exam, every time. You know, it's not like if you are seeing patients six times in one year, you don't need to do a physical exam every time, you know, you talk to them. You probably would like to do it at least once a year, twice a year. The rest yeah. of the visits can be uh, telemedicine. The only thing in yeah. Pakistan would be that here, you know, when you see a patient, you document in the chart, we file the bill to the insurance company and they pay you. The only question in Pakistan would be uh, for the private physicians, not for the government hospitals, for the private physicians, how do they get paid for these visits? Uh, there needs to be a systematic, you know, uh, systematic um, way of, of paying the physicians and making sure they're being compensated for their time. You know, that these, these are my views. Of course, as far as the billing goes, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's yeah. very different you know, in Pakistan compared to the U.S. anyways. You know, in Pakistan, every physician has a fee. Like you go in, okay, you're going to pay 2,000 rupees to this patient, It doesn't matter to, to this physician. It doesn't matter you have uh, just reflux or you are having a heart attack or you're having a serious abdominal problem. You pay a fixed fee to that physician, right? Here, you have to build the patient according to the severity of illness. So if a patient has one problem, just high blood pressure, the billing is different. If they have three problems, the billing is different. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be. You know, it, it, you are getting paid for, for your advice. And if you're advising on one thing, your, your compensation should be different. If you're advising on 10 things, you know, your compensation yeah. should be different. So a lot mm -hmm. of things in billing needs to be addressed, you know, when it comes to, comes to Pakistan. But billing I, and also maybe the insurance system. Yeah. Insurance system, yes. Mm -hmm. I think now they're giving some health cards to the, to the patients to, that they can use as, as a form of health insurance. Uh, but I'm not very familiar with the system, how that's working and if it's really mm -hmm. helping people or not, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. So for the viewers who joined late, so today we have Ahmed Arslan, Dr. Ahmed Arslan, who is assistant professor of nephrology in Houston. And he and we decided not to talk on coronavirus today. And we talked about his life experiences in Pakistan and in US and everything around his profession. But just before ending, uh, we will like to slightly talk about coronavirus again because we want to pay respect to the doctors uh, because it's, it's Difficult times, Def definitely it's difficult times and it's kind of war time for the doctors because everyone like uh, people like us who are in IT technology or other professions in restaurants and other things, we are staying at home trying to avoid contact. But for the doctors, they cannot avoid this contact. Uh, contact. And still we heard stories in many places that of the world that the doctors are suffering because they don't have the protective uh, gears and everything. So can you share some info? The feelings and about and the motivation level or the morale level of the doctors around you. Yeah, my, my feelings are very strong about this subject. You know, mostly because just uh, just three days ago, my father, you know, he's a physician in England. Uh, he works in Manchester, and he got diagnosed with coronavirus. Just you know, he was on vacation for a couple of weeks, and he went back to work. And of course, when the patient comes in, you don't know if the patient has coronavirus or they have some other kind of illness. So I think he got exposed. He's doing okay, thanks God. And we are praying for him. Where is he at the moment? Which city? He's in he's in Manchester, England. Okay. The city is called Huddersfield. So it's a city close to Manchester. Uh, he's at home. He's doing okay. We are hoping and praying, you know, because the first few days can be can be critical. You know, you may be feeling okay for a few days, and then things can 
can take a turn for the worse. But we are hoping for the best. Uh, and I'll ask, you know, whoever believes, you know, please uh, pray for his health as well. Um, the protective equipment, you know, it's all about preparedness at this time. Mm. And now that we have, you know, enough lag between the time that it started and, and now that it's towards, you know, the top of the curve and in some places it may be going down the curve, uh, now we are on the same page as far as the protective equipment goes. No one is trying to misguide the physicians now. That, mm. you know, uh, even for minor illnesses, you know, and this makes me really sad and upset that even for minor illnesses like flu or, you know, some other bacterial infections, the guidelines and, you know, the, there are societies that by guideline would recommend, oh, don't touch the patient, put the gloves on, put a mask on, put the gown on. And for something like coronavirus, the guidelines were not that strong. They said, yeah, 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 even a piece of cloth may be okay. You don't have to put a surgical mask when you're rounding in the hospital unless you know a patient has coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I think that was very, very naive or very, very uh, illogical. Uh, we've been trying to promote wearing a mask because being a physician, even if you're not you know, at the, at the helm of affairs, being a physician, you know it's a droplet-borne infection. Uh, it stays in the aerosols. Um, mm -hmm. for, for hours, you know, it stays on, it can live, the coronavirus can live on plastic and metal for at least 72 hours, on cardboard for at least 24 hours. So this is, this is out there. Unless you're just using some kind of protection, there is no way you won't catch it. So if you're exposed to anyone who has it, even if they're not symptomatic, and that's the big problem. Now we know, mm -hmm. even if it's someone is asymptomatic, they can still pass on the infection to you. So they don't have to be coughing in your face to, to cause the infection. You know, they may just have been there talking or they may be they sneezed like 30 minutes ago and you can still catch the infection. The good thing is that a lot of companies have come up with donations. A lot of companies that were not making the masks, were not making the gowns, especially the N95 masks, have started making it. Uh, I know about my hospital, um, the hospital is affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, they have more than two weeks supply. We, we get a daily update on, on the, this, the stack that they have for these protective equipment. Mm -hmm. And they tell you if anything is, you know, the stock is for, for one week, two weeks, more than two weeks. And for everything right now, they have a stock for, for, for more than two weeks. I know in New York, they're still struggling to find uh, the protective gear, mm -hmm. but but the intensive care doctors have it. So it's a lesson for the future. I think now, you know, for the corona, we are kind of, um, we know what we need to do. Of course, we don't know the treatments, the vaccination is not out there. Um, but for the future, uh, we just have to use common sense. We cannot just follow anyone's advice blindly and put ourselves yes. at, at risk. You know, you live only once. So yeah. you don't want to die because of Corona, you know, if you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So first of all, yeah. uh, really, uh, we wish uh, your father's, uh, we wish him speedy recovery. And it's really sad to hear about that he's also infected and I hope. And, and he was at his duty uh, seeing the patients when he got infected. So yeah. uh, more respect for all the doctors out there. And yeah. secondly, yes, you said right, that we don't have to follow the blind advice everywhere on social media in the first place everybody was yeah. saying that this is the treatment this is the treatment you know uh, but we need to be care very careful so even in advanced countries people were very ca careless uh, yeah. going outside yes yeah. so we, we need to be very careful and uh, i will again say thank you very much for your time well oh, thank you for having me it was so much fun yeah <laughs> yeah it was a pleasure so um uh, also thank you all the viewers i think this show had the most viewership until uh, now and uh, we have a next show today we have two shows today we have another show from a very interesting Do guest we have any more questions or are, I, I don't see them but we don't have any more questions right yeah so if people I saw have more questions, questions pop up but i don't know i can quickly answer them if anyone has i know we wasted a lot of your time but if you have any serious questions <laughs> yeah I'll if someone has quickly. any questions please write yeah. in the comments because okay. free advice from dr Ahmed yeah, 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 yeah. always free <laughs> I have a question. What is PT, PTSD? Oh, you have a question? Yeah, this is a post uh, post traumatic stress, stress disorder. disorder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it? 
Yeah, so, just the context about it because we have a next guest in in, in at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. EU time, and he is he was a former U.S. soldier. He he fought. He also spent one year yeah. in Afghanistan. So he is my next guest today, and he then he also spent some time in in Germany. He found his house here, so he has this PTSD. So you can explain a bit yeah, about. So basically, it's you know if you have any kind of trauma. That's very common in people who are veterans. You know, I used to work in VA Houston for a couple of years, and a lot of people who returned from war were exposed to trauma. Um, you know, they heard um, bombs dropping around them, or they saw their friends getting killed, um, or they were, you know, they were they were physically affected. They lost a limb. You know, mm. um, so they start having this psychological uh, thing afterwards where they have flashbacks you know mm. nightmares uh, they feel like the exact same thing is happening to them uh, what happened during that phase and it really affects how they function you know um, with their job with their life with their relationships with their social interactions um, it makes them depressed it can make them really uh, anxious mm -hmm. it can make them uh, worried, you know, all, all the time, make them phobic. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. have so we have a question from our it friend, is. Naveed from it Munich, is. and he's asking a very, <laughs> that, can you answer it? Yes, yes. It does affect the kidneys directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So when I was rounding on my patients last week, you know, out of the 20 corona patients who were in the hospital, uh, eight of those patients had kidney problems. Uh, now, some of the kidney problems are because all their organs are shutting down. So it's not because of the corona directly affecting the kidneys. It's because corona has affected the lungs, they're on the ventilator, the blood pressure drops, everything shuts down, their heart gets damaged, their kidney gets damaged. Uh, but there are also reports that coronavirus binds to these receptors called ACE2 receptors. I, I'm, I'm hoping this uh, the person who asked this is probably a physician or a medical student. So he's an engineer, IT, IT guy, my friend. Okay, then I won't go into details then. <laughs> but yes, yes, it does affect the kidneys. There are receptors on the kidneys that bind to the coronavirus and it can affect the function of the kidneys directly. Also, coronavirus can make very small clots in all the blood vessels of the body. And, you know, blood flow is really important to the function of the kidneys. Uh, so we have what we call these microthrombi, like really tiny clots that affect the blood flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And like every other organ, kidney is also uh, affected. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, there was one other question regarding coronavirus. Uh, let me ask. This is also a very physician question. I don't know. what. So do you have anything to say regarding the unique clinical picture the COVID-19 patients present with? And the conspiracy theories revolving around the whole issue. Yes, this I've, is a political question. I've heard the conspiracy theories. I think we should talk about it. Uh, why not? You know, we are okay. also Pakistanis. Why not? You know, <laughs> we believe in conspiracy theories. You know, the thing is, uh, there, the, the, it's not a conspiracy theory if you have some evidence or logic behind it. And the, the things that we know for a fact is that this, because... Uh, there are people working on viruses in the labs, you know, try to either helpful or hurtful to someone. They can modify the genetic um, uh, composition of the virus. And this virus was, as far as I know, and what I have read, of course, you know, these are the articles out there. They're all on the internet. And there are some, some of these articles are from respectable, you know, uh, sources. Uh, this virus was being worked on in the labs, you know, um, and no one knows if it got out intentionally or unintentionally, but it was in the labs. It started from the labs in Wuhan. Um, they say the U.S. kind of planted it. U.S. says China started it. Whoever started it, it was in the labs. There probably some kind of genetic modification to the virus. Uh, we had, you know, coronavirus, I'm not sure if you remember, there were two similar viruses, the same virus family that caused SARS, 
the severe acute respiratory distress syndrome and MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. SARS was, I think, in 2003, and then MERS was around 2012. And both of them caused less than 1,000 deaths overall. Like they spread really fast and the mortality rate was really high, but they caused less than 10,000 deaths. Why is this virus so virulent? Uh, why it's killing so many people and how come it's so transmitting so quickly is a question that needs to be answered. But, you know, uh, it's probably true that there's some human, you know, I, you know, I have a feeling and of course there's no evidence. It's not a medical advice. It's not a medical opinion. It's a personal opinion. Um, I have a feeling that there was some kind of human, you know, involvement in how this virus came into being. That's, that's, my, really that's, right my, right. That's, that's my personal feeling. You know, that's yeah. not the opinion of the medical community. So mm -hmm. I'm not talking on behalf of my institution. My opinions are my own. So this is my personal opinion sitting in my... And, and this is really scary also when, when you think about this. Yeah. yeah. So this is a we fact. Have, you know, the bioweapons, you know, bioweapons are, are, are a fact. So we have another question from Ahmed. Uh, what do you, what do, how do you visualize post-corona world? How different will it be from pre-corona world? Yeah, there will be less people for sure. <laughs> not so less, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully not so less. Um, I think post-corona world, a lot of, I, I can only speak from the medical community standpoint. I think a lot of things that we talked about, the telemedicine, how the patients are interacting, uh, how we deal with future pandemics is definitely going to be different. Uh, people are going to be more scared, so it's quite possible that any little virus that comes along is going to create the whole panic all over again. The countries are going to shut down, even if it's not as bad as coronavirus. So we have to try to get people out of this phobia uh, and paranoia that everything that's out there is going to kill them. We so have mental health is very important. Yeah, to mental health, them of course. Yeah, yeah, mental health is because we cannot be scared of every little virus that comes along in the future and then shut down our economies and people are again on the streets looking for unemployment and, you know, uh, and, 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 and dying of hunger. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's one thing that we have to work on. A lot of good things have happened, you know, the way this uh, the research has progressed. You know, uh, I know from from the medical community that a lot of information has been made free to public from all these journals who used to charge a lot of money to, to let you read an article. Now all the information about coronavirus is out there. Research articles used to take months and years to publish. You already have tons of research articles on the coronavirus. Things are coming out every day, a couple of new things. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the way things are progressing with the research, with the vaccine development, uh, I think that's, uh, and the way FDA approved, you know, all these new treatments and research medications, uh, I think it's going to have a positive effect in the future uh, if we have to deal with the new pandemic. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the next, uh, another question from uh, Mrs. Nusra Shirazi is that how often a diabetic patient should get his kidneys checked because your nephrology? That's, uh, a very good question. That's a very good question. If they don't have any kidney problems, once a year is enough. You know, um, you can check your kidney function and it's not just the kidney function. The earliest sign of kidney damage uh, in a patient who has diabetes, and it's a very good question because diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease. So the reason people go on dialysis, diabetes is the top reason. And if you manage the diabetes, detect it earlier, you can delay the onset of end-stage kidney disease. Mm -hmm. But it, the, the earliest damage to the kidneys is noticeable in the urine. So you have to look for protein in the urine. You call it microalbumin, like the small uh, protein. Uh, you have to look for protein in the urine, not just the kidney function. The kidney function may stay normal for many, many years, even when the kidney damage is going on. So usually when you check the blood test, look at the kidney function, it may be normal, even if kidneys are affected. So make sure when you see your doctor, ask them to check your urine for microalbumin, or mm -hmm. just tell them you want to make sure there's no protein in the urine. So mm -hmm. that's what they should check. So Wendy is asking, uh, any new recommendations to say, stay healthy? in current situation yeah i would say don't watch the news <laughs> but besides that you know anything that you you have been doing to keep yourself healthy is still good you know immunity is really important you to fight against infections so as i said earlier you know eating a healthy diet uh, exercising regularly even if it's indoors whatever gets your heart rate up you don't have to lift heavy weights, um, but anything that can get your heart rate 
to you know to a to a higher number is good. Make sure you sleep well. You don't want to sleep only two or three hours a day because you're binge watching something on mm -hmm. Netflix or Amazon. Uh, at least six to eight hours of sleep. Um, and you know, people are talking about vitamin C to boost your immunity. People are talking about zinc sulfate to keep yourself healthy. Uh, there's no evidence to support it, but I don't see any downside of using vitamin C unless you have any prior medical problems. So if you're a healthy person, you can either start taking vitamin C or start eating or drinking stuff that has vitamin C, like orange juice, lemonade, mm -hmm. stuff with citrus fruits. Uh, they can keep you healthy. Some people believe that zinc sulfate is involved in the terminal pathway that causes damage uh, in the COVID disease. So zinc sulfate supplements is not a bad idea. Again, the, again, there's no evidence to support it, but whatever helps, you know, as long as you don't have any medical conditions that prevent the use of these things, um, it's okay. So I would say a healthy lifestyle overall. And the, the healthiest thing to do right now is to stay away from anyone that you are not sure might be carrying the infection. You know, okay. you, you can only catch it from other human beings or being around places where a lot of people have been, you know, because uh, the coronavirus can stay on these surfaces for a very long time. So mm -hmm. wash your hands diligently. Uh, don't touch anything you don't have to touch. Don't touch anything and touch your face and nose, you know, all the usual stuff. Mm. So thank you. Thank you very much, actually. And uh, Another question from Ramis from Chemnitz, Germany, is that what's your take on passive immunization technique against Corona? I think we talked slightly about it. I think by passive immunization, he means that you catch the infection and then become immunized. I think that's what the question is. Like, let everyone get infected. Whoever makes it, makes it. And who doesn't make it, you know, <laughs> will be in heaven, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. The, uh, if, if that's the question, if I'm understanding it right, I mm -hmm. think eventually everyone, a lot of people would get infected. You know, this virus is not going to die in one or two months. The problem is we don't want everyone to get infected at the same time because we're talking about this curve, right? We have to flatten the curve. So if the healthcare capacity is this, you don't want the curve to go up here. You want the curve to stay below the healthcare capacity. So if people are sick and when they go to the hospital, they have ventilators available, they have you know medical uh, personnel available to take care of them, and not everyone just swamps the hospitals at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, yes, you know, eventually when everyone catches it, the, the the other problem is that we are not sure once you catch the infection, are you going to be immune for the future? It's also controversial. We don't know for sure because this coronavirus can mutate. So you may get infection from one strain of coronavirus and become immune to that strain, but in the near future, you may get infected from another strain. So in 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 that situation, I'm not sure if herd immunity is going to protect everyone. You know, um, just like influenza, we mm -hmm. vaccinate against influenza every year. We still see tons of cases because you cannot vaccinate against every possible mutation of the virus. So again, mm. the research is going on on this uh, subject. I don't have the, the final answer, but that's my thought on it. Yes, thank you very much. I think we have answered all the questions or actually we're over time. I think people really liked the show and they had a lot of questions. So first of all, uh, thanks again that you gave Thank your you. time. I think it's in its morning, maybe 8.30 a.m. in yeah. Houston. What's the time? Yeah. It's, it's so you must go, you, you, you have to get ready to go to the yeah. office maybe, yeah. or it's to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So thanks. Thank you very much. And no, thank, thank you for, all the guests. Uh, thank you for doing this. And thank you for giving me the time to speak up my mind. I really appreciate it. It was good seeing you after a long time. We should do it more often, you know, even if it's not Facebook Live. This face to face is good. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. And and uh, last thing again, guys, uh, five p.m. EU time. We have a guest who was a former U.S. Uh, uh, soldier, and he was in, in um, Afghanistan also. And then he had PTSD, uh, stress disorder. But we will not talk much about that. But we will talk about importance of good communication, good dialogue, how it can uh, uh, bring positive change to our lives. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you once again, Dr. Ahmed Arsalaam. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Good luck. Bye.